13-year-old Megami Yakoda had been attending a badminton club's practice at the Nagata Middle School where she attended. Her family, consisting of her mother, Saki Yakoda, father, Shigeru, and two younger twin brothers, Takuya and Tetsuya, had just moved from Hiroshima and were new to the neighborhood. Although, the family had gotten used to being the newcomers. Megami's father, Shigeru, worked for the Bank of Japan, and as part of his job, he and his family would be transferred to different cities every four to five years. First in Nagoya, then Tokyo, then Hiroshima, and now Nagata. But Nagata, unlike other cities the Yokota family had lived, seemed eerily lonely, and Saki noticed that Megami was becoming shy or reserved among strangers. After all, Megami had left all her friends in Hiroshima. But upon moving into middle school in Nagata, Megami seemed to be growing out of her shell, joining various clubs and groups, one of which was the badminton club. Practice would usually run until 6pm, and Megami typically wouldn't be home too much later, as the middle school was fairly close to her house. Her mother, Saki, would always worry about this walk home from practice, as the road is only covered by dimly lit street lamps. However, one night in particular, November 15th, 1977, Saki Yakoda noticed that her daughter was unusually late. The clock was reading past 7pm, and there was still no sign of Megami. Usually, if Megami was going to be late, she'd tell her mom before she left, as she'd done the day before. But that day, Megami hadn't said anything. Confused, Saki had run to the middle school Megami was practicing at, only to see that all the middle school students had left. Now panicking, she called Megami's friends to ask if they'd seen her, but they all said the same thing, that they'd seen Megami walking home with her friends and didn't remember anything unusual. At first, Saki had thought that Megami might have stopped by the doctor's office on the way home, as she remembered Megami complaining about knee pain, but upon checking their records, it was clear that she hadn't come in. So, Saki, along with her two twin sons and now a teacher that she'd called, started looking up and down the neighborhood for any sign of Megami, checking parked cars, the shoreline, and the shrine near their house. But, after an hour of searching, not one piece of clothing or personal item was found, and at this point, Saki thought it was best to call her husband and the police. Saki's husband, Shigeru, was at work playing mahjong with his colleagues to welcome a new transferred employee, but upon realizing that Megami was missing, he, along with three colleagues, came straight home. Police, after having searched the entire neighborhood again, brought two German shepherds to see if they could sniff out Megami's trail. They discovered that Megami had gone home with two of her friends. One had turned right at the corner and the other had turned left at the intersection, leaving Megami alone. The dogs followed her trail up until this intersection, where it seemed as if she disappeared into thin air. Saki later said, it was dark and the vacant lot was overgrown with weeds and shrubs, so even if there had been a shoe or something lying around, none of us could have seen it. So, at around midnight, police called off the search, resuming the next morning. In the following weeks and months, police exhausted all resources looking for Megami. Going from house to house, asking questions, searching the nearby beach for any of Megami's belongings, using divers to search underwater, but still nothing. It was at this point when Megami's parents started thinking of every scenario that could have taken place that day. They thought that she might have gotten hit by a car. Her husband theorized that the driver might have been intoxicated and disposed of Megami to avoid getting in trouble. Police also initially shared this belief, but there was no tire marks, glass, or any indication that anything, let alone a car crash, had happened at that intersection. Although, the police did have one more theory, that Megami might have gotten kidnapped by a gang she could have been knocked unconscious or forced into a car. Saki even entertained the idea that Megami might have been severely depressed and wanted to run away from home, or worse, commit suicide. They called friends and family in different cities to see if Megami was with them and check the passenger list for a nearby ferry, but discovered nothing. They even suggested that she might have drowned herself but found it unlikely as Megami, from a young age, has been scared of water. By this point, Saki was desperate for answers and even started to think that maybe they had failed as parents. Perhaps we were overprotective, yet given the reality of her absence, I found myself hoping that she had run away. At least then there was a hope that I would be able to see her again, sometime, somewhere. <laughs> Shintoza, 
あなたが本当に自分で出ていくとはどうしても思えませんあの暗い道で何かがあったんじゃないかとそればっかり思ってどんな辛い思いで暮らしているのかと思うともう本当にどうしていいかわからない状態ですどうぞ元気でいるのならたった一言でいいですから電話なりハガキの一本なりよこしてください全国の皆さんどうぞこの子をどこかで見かけた方 Years passed and the family had centered their daily lives around looking for Megami Every day, after Saki would finish her housework, she'd walk in a different part of town in the hope that her and Megami would cross paths. One parent would be home at all times in case Megami called, and the door was left unlocked and the light on all night to show that they hadn't forgotten about her. The disappearance affected every other aspect of life as well. The family stopped going on vacations or family get togethers, and the Bank of Japan had delayed Shiguro's next move. After six years, though, Shiguru and his family were asked to transfer to Tokyo, and although they left with a heavy heart, they thought it might be good to start fresh. After all, they couldn't keep living in Nagata forever. But the move to Tokyo only seemed to magnify Megami's disappearance. Whenever my husband or I walked along the street, we couldn't help but notice if there was a girl about Megami's age. But worst of all were the unidentified post mortem pictures that Saki and Shiguru had to look over to potentially identify Megami. I looked at each photo, and whenever I came across a woman with a round face like Megami's, my heart would stop. The experience was so unbearably frightening. Little did Megami's parents know, 8,000 kilometers away, Korean Flight 858 was taking off, which would eventually reveal the first of many clues as to the whereabouts of Megami Yukoda. Around 30 minutes before midnight on November 29, 1987, Korean Air Flight 858 had taken off from Iraq, its scheduled destination being Seoul, after two stops in Abu Dhabi and Bangkok. Around an hour prior to departure, though, two North Koreans, Kim Sung il and Kim Hyun hee, had set a bomb disguised as a radio to explode in exactly nine hours. Their top secret mission, as they called it, Was to place the bomb in an overhead compartment, get off the plane at the Abu Dhabi layover, and when the bomb goes off, hopefully kill everyone on board the flight. The mission's objective, supposedly given by Kim Jong il himself, was to make South Korea seem unsafe for the upcoming Summer Olympics in Seoul. Nonetheless, the plan had been going smoothly. The plane took off on schedule, landed in Abu Dhabi, and the two North Koreans, who'd been disguised as Japanese tourists, promptly disembarked. And so, at around the end of the flight from Abu Dhabi to Bangkok, the bomb detonated, launching the plane into the Andaman Sea and killing all 115 souls on board. But, as the North Koreans were trying to make their getaway, it was found out that they were using fake Japanese passports. And upon being apprehended, both Kim Sung il and Kim Hyun hee quickly bit into an ampule of cyanide that they were given to commit suicide as a last resort. And while Kim Sung il had died after ingesting the cyanide, Kim Hyun hee was nursed back to health and taken to South Korea for interrogation. It was there where she confessed that while in North Korea, she'd been taught the Japanese language by a woman who'd been abducted from a beach in Japan. Now, although this woman was later proved not to be Megami, it did confirm something that had been circulating around the general public at the time that North Korea was abducting people from other countries. But at this point, Megami's parents hadn't known about the plane bombing or the North Korean spy. And didn't even seriously think that North Korea had abducted their daughter. Until 1997, after 20 years of non stop grief and misery, things would change for the Yakota family, and they'd find themselves launched into the public spotlight, all starting with one phone call. It was January 21st, 1997, when a now retired Shiguru had received a phone call. Upon picking it up, he was informed that a Diet member, basically a Japanese government official, had been asking for Shigeru's phone number. Upon receiving the man's phone number, he called his secretary, who then informed Shigeru that, quote, I have information that your daughter is alive in North Korea. The man, Tatsukichi Hiyamoto, had said that they shouldn't discuss this over the phone and invited him to meet in person. It was during that meeting when Shigeru was told that there was strong evidence suggesting that, since the 1970s, 
North Korea had been abducting Japanese and South Korean citizens, and Megami, all the way back in 1977, might have been a victim. Although, after 20 years of getting their hopes up for every clue about Megami and being let down every single time, they had a hard time believing that this was true. However, what seemed to push them over the edge was an interview with a North Korean spy, only named Mr. Ahn. Mr. Ahn claimed that during a commemoration to the Workers' Party in North Korea, he'd seen a 25 to 27-year-old woman who looked Japanese, and he remembered that one of his instructors had told him she'd been brought from Nagata. After being asked when and how the woman was abducted, Mr. Ahn claimed that three North Korean agents had been walking in Nagata when they saw the girl, and fearing that she'd report seeing them, they abducted her. It was only when she wouldn't stop crying on the ship to North Korea when the agents realized they'd abducted a child. After arriving in North Korea, Mr. Ahn said that Megami wouldn't stop crying and refused to eat. The agents were chastised for abducting a 13-year-old girl, but Megami was told if she studied the Korean language hard enough, she would be sent home. Once Megami found that this was a lie, she said to have become a danger to herself and was hospitalized twice. Later, when Megami was supposedly in her 20s, he said that she seemed outgoing and was laughing with other women. He said that she had a round, full face and wore her hair straight with bangs cut across her forehead. She lived near a university and was a valuable Japanese teacher, so she lived pretty comfortably. This bombshell interview gained attention in the media, and it was the first time that the Japanese government publicly acknowledged that the multiple Japanese citizens that had gone missing might have been abducted by North Korea. But despite this breakthrough, the Japanese government initially did little to solve the abduction issue. Japanese and North Korean relations had historically been marked by tension and hostility, and in the 1990s, North Korea had vehemently denied having abducted any foreign citizens and had even walked out of negotiating rooms at the very mention of the victims' names. But something that North Korea couldn't deny at the time was that it needed help. The country had been in famine for years and needed emergency rice from Japan, and so it allowed talks between the two countries. But because Japan wasn't getting any closer to solving the abduction issue, protests had started to form outside of political party buildings. But the abduction issue in Japan wasn't just about Megami. To this day, 17 Japanese people are recognized as having been abducted by North Korea. Some were abducted in pairs of two, like Hitomi Soga and her mother, or Kaioru Hasuki and his girlfriend, but others were taken alone, usually near a beach or walking alone at night. Some were even abducted outside of Japan, one being kidnapped in Denmark and two others in Spain. What was strange, though, was that most of these abductions seemed to have been opportunistic with North Korean commandos taking any person who was unlucky enough to stroll along some Japanese beach where the commandos were lying in wait. It seems, based on statements given by North Korean defectors, that the abductees were used to teach North Korean spies language skills and mannerisms of Japanese daily life. <laughs> Nevertheless, as the years passed into the 2000s, public pressure about the abductions grew, and with it, a new prime minister was elected into office, Junichiro Koizumi. Seen as a very fierce leader, Koizumi took a more assertive and blunt approach to the abduction issue, and by 2002, he was invited into North Korea to meet with Kim Jong-il and discuss issues between the two countries. 
Unbeknownst to the rest of the world, this talk would later lead to an unexpected sequence of events, eventually revealing the supposed fate of the Japanese citizens who'd been abducted. It's not exactly known what was said behind closed doors between these two leaders, but miraculously, these fateful talks in September 2002 resulted in Kim Jong-il formally acknowledging and apologizing for the abduction of Japanese citizens, including Megami Yakoda. The catch, though, was that he admitted to abducting only 13 people, two less than the official count at the time. He also claimed that of the 13 people abducted, only 5 were alive, and the other 8, including Megami, had died in captivity. Most causes of death were given as traffic accidents or gas poisoning, but Megami's was given as suicide. It was later explained that she had committed suicide in 1993 after suffering from mental illness. It was also later claimed by someone close to Megami that she'd been in bed with a headache, quote, for a long time before she died. One day, she was taken to the hospital, and she didn't come back. A doctor who claimed to be the one who treated Megami in hospital said that she was depressed and barely talked. North Korea provided death certificates of the abductees who died, but said that they only had the remains of Megami and one other abductee, Kayaru Matsuki. The others, they claimed, were buried in burial grounds that had been washed away by torrential rainfall. In the following weeks, North Korea agreed to hand over all death certificates and remains that they had, and in a surprising decision, they even let the five abductees who were still alive return home, but only on the condition that they would fly back to North Korea after two weeks. So, around 20 years after they were abducted, the five victims returned to Japan, but family members and the press quickly realized that something was off. After spending most of their life in North Korea, the abductees had returned with Kim Jong-il pins pinned to their coats, and had requested that they wouldn't be asked about their life in North Korea, or their past. Sources say that they'd even said they prefer their life in North Korea and wouldn't want to stay in Japan. The Japanese government and the media accepted this awkward charade. The media made a pact not to pursue the abductees and ask them uncomfortable questions. Even the police declined to interview them about the kidnappings to avoid pressuring them to talk about it. But as the days went on, and families saw just how much their sons and daughters had been brainwashed by the regime, it was decided by the Japanese government to keep the abductees in Japan so they'd be able to, quote, make a free judgment, suggesting that they're still under the influence of North Korea. Also revealed in 2002 was the existence of Megami's daughter. Apparently, in the late 1980s, Megami had married an abducted South Korean and had a daughter named Kim Hee Young, who Megami's parents wouldn't meet until 2014. <laughs> But, with this abundance of information came obvious skepticism. First, it was clear that the death certificates provided had been hastily created before they were handed over. All the certificates were issued by the same hospital and had the same certification stamps. And various documents had certain sentences or words missing, almost as if they'd been redacted. It was also noticed that the hospital records had seemed to be written over, and what seems to be a hospital patient register, admission and discharge, is crossed out and replaced with deceased. Next was the problem of Megami Yakoda herself. North Korea and Megami's husband had initially claimed that she had died in 1993 after suffering from mental illness, but multiple Japanese abductees who'd come home had said that they remember seeing her in 1994. Later, Megami's husband had agreed it was 1994, and claimed he only said 1993 because of a, quote, illusional mistake. And lastly, there was the problem of Megami's remains. 
By 2004, North Korea had handed over what they claimed to be Megami's cremated remains, but upon taking five samples and finding DNA from two different sources in the remains, neither of them matched the DNA from Megami's umbilical cord, which her parents had kept, as is common in Japan. Nothing that would be taken from the remains suggested that they were Megami's, leading the Japanese government to believe the remains were either fake or of another person. However, an article later published claimed that the testing was performed by a relatively junior faculty member at a Japanese university, and that he had no previous experience in the testing of cremated remains. This article suggested that, whether they knew it or not, Japan might have done the testing incorrectly, and gotten a wrong conclusion as a result. In the words of the article, Dealing with North Korea is no fun, but it doesn't justify breaking the rules of separation between science and politics. All these issues, again, served as a wedge between North Korea and Japan, furthering the tension and the hatred between the two countries. The mix of lies told by North Korea over the course of 40 years have conditioned the Japanese public and government to doubt every word that comes out of the regime. And it's because of this that the ability to prove or disprove Megami's whereabouts is almost impossible. Despite this, in Japan, it's widely believed that Megami Okoda is still alive and that North Korea has kept her for any number of reasons. She might be too valuable of an asset or knows too much sensitive information. Since the events of the early 2000s, multiple North Korean defectors have said that Megami is alive, and others have said that she's not, but there's no way to confirm or deny their statements. The other theory is that Megami Okoda did indeed pass away, which is entirely plausible, although why North Korea then lied about the year she supposedly committed suicide is unknown. North Korea continues to maintain the position that the abduction issue is solved, and that there's nothing more they can do. In the years to follow, multiple rounds of talks and meetings have led to mostly inconclusive results. Since 2004, Japan has asked North Korea multiple times to investigate the whereabouts or any information about the other abductees to conclusively confirm whether they're deceased or not. And almost every time, North Korea has presented incomplete information, information that lacks concrete evidence, or just failed to make any progress. However, Japan continues to try and pressure North Korea into investigating the abductions. On June 5, 2020, Shigeru Yokota passed away from natural causes, and to this day, the whereabouts or state of Megami Yokota is unknown. <laughs>